this time on the Highland Woodworker. So I've been woodworking since I was riding my tricycle and chasing the dog around in his shop. From carving to turning to even creating lifelike flowers, master woodworker Sheila Collins does it all. She'll tell us the story behind her pieces and show us how to get a perfect fit when putting a top on a box. Every woodworker runs into a situation in their shop when they need a clamp that can reach in deep and tighten down solidly. Popular Woodworking Magazine reveals the steps to building your very own deep reach clamp. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. We're here at Highland Woodworking's live online classroom. Be sure to go to highlandwoodworking.com to sign up for upcoming classes and shop their entire catalog for fine tools delivered straight to your door. Over the years, we have showcased many artists that oftentimes specialize in a certain area of woodworking. Today, we are excited to introduce you to Sheila Collins, a lifelong woodworker who is passionate about all aspects of the craft. Join us as we go to her workshop on her Tennessee farm for a moment with a master. Well, I'm here with Sheila Collins in her workshop, and she has got some great work here. And I think the term is, wow. Tell us about it. Okay, well, I like to do a lot of different things. Uh, I'm not scared to put one foot in front of the other and start making sawdust. So I have a segmented cutting board here, and I got to be a workshop assistant with Alex Snodgrass for one of his cutting board classes. And because I was an assistant, I didn't get to keep my cutting board, but nobody wanted their scraps, so I have a little bit of his class in the cutting board here where I use the scraps, but I like to do a lot of turning. I do wood burning, so this is actually um, a wood burn plaque where I collected flowers and used the flowers to do the layout and burn the background and then actually painted it after I did it. And I do boxes. I like to do a lot of carving, everything from walking sticks to a Baroque style carving. That's actually a Steve Bisco pattern that I found online. How about that? Uh, they're, they're all beautiful. You know, one of the things I see here is you like to play in your shop. I do. You think the, the idea that you're willing to take a chance is important? It's a big factor in having fun with a lot of it. I do very little by plans. I do custom work for customers and they'll come up and, you know, here's a picture, can you make this? So I almost get frustrated working with a plan because I'm not mm -hmm. used to working with plans. I'm used to making my own plans. And so you, you start something and it evolves in your mind as you work, is, is that? It does. A lot of times uh, when I'm driving into work in the morning or driving home in the evening, I'll be thinking about projects that I'm working on and kind of planning things out. I may tell somebody, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. And by the time I get home, then I've figured out where I'm going to start with it. And then you may have to make some changes on the fly. but. The creative part I tell students when I'm teaching classes. I have one class, there's no plan. And it says, as long as you tell me that you're frustrated with something, or I see that you're having an issue with something, we can take lemons, we can make lemonade. And you can end up with some really creative stuff. So you start out and the students are really nervous and they're real tentative. And by the end of the class, if you've got six students, you have six different boxes. And everybody's like, oh, I like what you did, or you know, maybe I'll make a change here. So it's a lot of fun. And, and sometimes, like uh, uh, this piece right here, uh, it's all about the wood and unleashing its, its beauty, its, its natural beauty. But there's an artist in you that, that finds it. And tell us about how you look to, to use a piece of wood and, and how you uh, let it become uh, its own artistry. 
Now, I'm attracted to, as you can tell, the highly figured pieces of wood. I don't do very much really plain stuff. If I'm using plain wood, then it turns into something like this right here. But I start looking at something. A lot of times I will cut a piece of wood off of a bowl blank because it has cracks in it, and I don't want cracks in the bowl. And if it gets lay around the shop and gets kicked a few times and it doesn't break up when I get through with everything else I'm working on, I may come back and turn it just to see if I can mm -hmm. for, the, for the adventure and the challenge. You know, I think part of being an artist at whatever you're, you're doing is to uh, keep working at it until it smiles at you and, and you start getting something that, uh, that fits with uh, your vision. And that vision is always kind of moving. It's, it's practice. I can remember when I was younger and I would have to have something to give me an idea to start working on something. Now I see something and go, oh, that's going to be whatever. Yeah. And it's just uh, the old thing of when you're carving, whatever your carving's in there, you just have to take away every shaving that doesn't look like the thing that's in there. That's right. So many people have a hard time getting started. Uh, they think they have to have a complete plan. But as you mentioned, uh, that's not your approach. Yeah. And it's just, you start something, you make a mistake. No, no matter how many boxes I've made, I make mistakes occasionally. And it's all about what you do with your mistake. My husband could do woodworking. He mm -hmm. won't. He said, if I make a mistake, I've got to throw it in the burn barrel and start over. Mm -hmm. I told him that's the craftsman part of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I tell you what, this is, is really impressive. Uh, my eye was pulled toward this. And I thought, well, she just has a nice little vase out here. Uh, and that this might be something, I don't, wouldn't know where it came from. But it came from the brain of Sheila Collins. Tell me about it. Those are wood carved flowers. And when I first started out, all the whittling books will show you how to do a little flower that looks kind of like this top portion here. Mm -hmm. But over time, as I carved them, then I started adding other details to it. So I can actually get some that kind of twist around. They have different levels to them. And I even do one that is reminiscent of a dandelion. And as far as I know, I'm the only one that does a dandelion. I've never seen anything else that looks remotely like a dandelion. Well, that is really a, an eye catcher and it's just some beautiful work. Uh, it's kind of unleashing the wood to be something almost totally different. Uh, is there a little bit of tension in the wood as you carve it that just causes it to open? There is the amount of moisture that's in the wood. There's a point where there's too much moisture. You now we're fixing to get into spring with the sap rising. Mm -hmm. So if you take a fresh cut piece of wood and immediately try to carve it, it won't curve, won't curl very well. Mm -hmm. And if it's dry, it's a lot harder to cut. So there's a there's an ideal point with the moisture is just right. You can actually get some really nice curls, just like you've taken a pair of scissors and put them across the ribbon and made the ribbon curl. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sheila, uh, this is going to be a beautiful box that you have underway here. I, I love the relief carving. And where did you get the patterns from? This is actually from a gun carving uh, book. I wanted to try my hand doing the basket weave and the oak leaf pattern. So the larger part of the pattern is actually from the grip that's right behind the trigger on a shotgun or something like that. And the little small oak leaf down in the corner is from the forestock pattern that would be in front of the trigger and just wanted to try it so I carved it on a piece of mahogany and then built the top with different types of molding to fit the box. Yeah. Usually I build it all as one but I actually did this one the reverse of what it would do. Mm -hmm. So it can leave my house and go live with someone else and I have room for something else when I do another carving. I'm getting the idea you find your inspiration everywhere but a Younger Sheila uh, became inspired to do this how? I've been carving since I was small enough to be able to bag my dad's pocket knife out of his pocket. <laughs> and if I ever screwed up and got cut, I would clean it off, fold it up, hide the cut behind my back, hand it to him, and when he turned his back, 
run to the house for a Band-Aid. <laughs> so I've been carving. I can't tell you when I started carving. I've been carving since I was little. I remember when I was probably 12, I carved a version of the the thinker that's sitting there with his head on his chin. When I was in college, someone I either bought a carving book or someone gave me a carving book. And there was a golfer mm -hmm. that's taking and hiding his toe and kicking his ball out from behind the bush to save his stroke before he makes his next shot. Was there somebody in your family or somebody that uh, influenced you to be artistic? We grew up in a family, I grew up on a dairy farm. We raised our own food, we you know, raised our own meat, processed our own meat, had a woodworking shop, had a blacksmith forge, we made a lot of our own equipment. My dad actually basically made every piece of equipment in the shop except for a DeWalt radio arm saw. Every other piece of woodworking equipment was made from scratch by either he or my grandfather. And did they make those tools available to you as you grew older, I guess? I did. I was actually, um, Rockwell came out with the Blade Runner, which was kind of a table-mounted jigsaw. Mm -hmm. My dad actually had a wall-mounted Thing that was very similar to that that he had made and I could use it if I bent the blade he was okay with that he had a block of wood I could pound all the nails I wanted into it and everything was fine so I've been woodworking since I was riding my tricycle and chasing the dog around in his shop what kind of jobs have you had and how did they kind of work into your life as an artist my training was as a teacher and I had a several jobs as a substitute, but never could land a full-time position and had an opportunity to go to work in the hospitals as an exercise specialist. Mm -hmm. And never looked back. I've always continued to find ways to teach because I thoroughly enjoy teaching. But when I finished up a position, I was gonna to have to start driving through all the downtown traffic. We were headed out when everybody else was driving in and I was gonna to have to start driving downtown to the hospitals. Mm -hmm and had no desire to drive and rush hour traffic anymore, so I told the hospital I would take my severance pay and go to work for McDonald's. So started working for Lumberyard and started teaching woodworking classes, and that has been my McDonald's and a lot of fun. <laughs> well, that, that sounds like a great background for, uh, for woodworking. It's all solving problems. It's all vision. It's all having fun with wood. You, you fit that profile extremely well and, and your work is, like I said, I think I said, wow, love it. Later in the show, we'll head back to Sheila's workshop for a lesson on lid making. But first, Popular Woodworking Magazine has a project of their own to share. Making a deep reach clamp is next. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Just add the Boro workbench top and you've got a great auxiliary table anywhere in your shop. Upgrade your shop today.
Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. Every word worker runs into a situation in their shop when they need a clamp that can reach in deep and tighten down solidly. Well, if you've ever had those times, I've got a clamp that's easy to make, and we're gonna show you how to make it today. It's the Woodsmith Deep Reach Clamp. It only consists of a few parts. There are two hardwood jaws, as you see here. They are attached at the back with a hinge, a half-inch carriage bolt, a handle with a coupling nut, and a washer, simple as that. But this clamp's handy, can open to a wide range of capacities. You're sure to want to make several for your shop. Now to get started, I'm going to begin by laying out my sides on my blank of hardwood. And the first step is to go to the bandsaw, and we're gonna do that now. Well, I finished sanding the jaws, and I also eased the edges a little bit. Now, a couple things to point out. One, make sure that the grain is running parallel to the length of the jaw for maximum strength. Two, note that the end of the jaw is rounded slightly, so no matter how open or closed the jaws are, they'll still bear evenly on your workpiece. Also, this top of our jaw is not parallel to the bottom. When you look at the two jaws together, they need to be able to close tightly and have room to open. So this is not parallel to the back. Now, with all that said, our next step is going to be to drill a one-half inch hole for our carriage bolt. And in the other jaw, I'm going to drill a 9 sixteenths by one and one-half long slot to give the top of the carriage bolt a little room to move. Well, with the jaws of our clamp done, it's time to move on to the handle. The first step in making the handle is going to be to drill a 13 16 inch hole through our handle blank. Now, that hole is to accommodate this, a coupling nut. Now, 13 16 may sound like kind of an odd number, and it is, but it's just the right size for a snug press fit of our coupling nut with a little bit of epoxy into our handle blank. Now, after I've drilled this hole, the next step is going to be to bandsaw the side profile of the handle out. When that is done, I'll lay out a top profile and follow that at the bandsaw as well. To complete the handle, what I'm going to do is put a little bit of epoxy on each side of our coupling nut, some epoxy within the hole in the handle blank, and then I'll press the two together using this F-clamp. Now, the reason for the F-clamp is when I push this coupling nut through the handle, I'm going to get a little bit of epoxy coming out the back. It'll just make for a little easier cleanup. Well, that's the last screw for the hinge that holds the two jaws together. Now, while my two jaws are both in the vise, I'm going to go ahead and insert the carriage bolt in place. And now I'll take the washer, put that on the carriage bolt, followed by our completed handle. 
With this assembly in the vise, I'm going to go ahead and tighten the handle to the point where it pulls the head of the carriage bolt securely into the lower jaw. And there we go. So this is our completed deep reach clamp. All it needs is a couple of coats of oil and a project to work on, and it's done. Coming up, Sheila Collins shows us how to top that box. Don't go anywhere. You're watching the Highland Woodwork. There's four words that Lee Tools lives by. Four words that mean quality joinery to take your projects to the next level. Whether it's dovetails, box joints, or mortise and tenon. And we'll even help you clean up. Those four words, better tools, better results. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside Router Bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. Well, this is the magic moment when my masterpiece or your masterpiece comes in contact with Masterpiece Wood Finish Oil. It just comes alive. This is a great piece of wood and it's going to just look brilliant. Masterpiece Wood Finish causes your masterpiece. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. Well, Sheila, you've got this nice box you've started. Uh, what have you got to do today? Well, this is a box that I made to show some students in a class how to glue their box up so it's not finished, so it needs a top. So I have to figure out what's going to look good with it. So the walnut would look good with the spalted hackberry, but it's kind of plain. I don't really like that. So I have a box of other stuff over here. Ah, the options box. And sometimes if I find a piece of wood that's just too pretty to throw away, but it's not big enough for anything else, I get my board stretcher out and <laughs> I can actually glue pieces together and make a uh, really interesting pattern and use that. That would make a pretty inlay in something, but don't really want to do that. So let me see what else I have here. You know, I've got all kinds of uh, crazy stuff that I've glued up. That one looks close. So that one actually fits in there very nicely, but if I let go, it's going to fall. So I have to do something to hold it in place. So Thinking, take these strips, trim them down, miter them around the edge, and then I have my lid. And what is th what is this wood? This is Wingay. Okay. Yeah, that would that would be very uh, contrasting. It would it pull out the the darker colors there. And, and actually, this actually already has a little thin piece of inlay around the curly maple 
mm -hmm. in the top. Yeah, that looked great. So this is some more of how you just kind of work through step by step as an artist. Yeah, well, let's see. All right, well, let's get this out of the way. And I don't need a very big piece, so we'll cut this down. And I actually have a quarter sawn piece and a piece that's flat sawn, so it gives me two different grain options for the look. I'm going to go with a quarter sawn. And I'm thinking 3 sixteenths of an inch is probably good, so I'm going to cut it fairly thin. I love your perfectly scaled push stick. Yes. <laughs> I like my fingers. Yes. I've been using a table saw since I was 12, and so far, so good. And the one bad finger I have has nothing to do with woodworking, the rope and pulley, in case you have that in the shot. So I'm thinking I like that. Mm -hmm. Looks great. So now we need to miter it. So cutting the little small miters are very hard to do. It's very easy for the wood to splinter and become damaged. So I have a nice little miter sled that I've built that I can cut very small pieces very safely. Now I'm going to get everything turned the way I want it to go. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm not, uh, I can be very precise and get out the measuring tools if I need to, but I'm very much a windage person, so I'm going to eyeball it, and I'm going to make two cuts. <laughs> So now I have two ends that are mitered. So now we have to figure out what the rest of the cuts need to be. So I'm going to line the miter up so it comes straight off of the mitered corner on the top that I already have. And then I'm going to mark the other side. piece is just a little bit too short.
Okay, so that looks like it fits, so we're ready to cut the rest. <laughs> And all that's left is to glue it together. Sheila, thank you so much. This has really been a treat. And thank you for coming out today. Well, I'm here with Lynn Reinhardt and a Shaper Origin. I've been looking forward to seeing what it can do. Can you show us? I can do that, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Um, well, the Shaper Origin can do many things from prototyping to making parts to one-offs to joinery. Today, what I'd like to show you is a thing that I use it for um, probably on a weekly basis. Since I do a lot of furniture repair, a lot of times I have to do an inlay. Mm -hmm. And inlays can take forms of like a dog bone or a uh, butterfly, or you can create a, an amorphous shape, like an organic shape to fit into something a defect in the wood or even an accent. So what I'd like to demonstrate to show you, which I think is really incredible, is that we're gonna cut a plug of um, 0.63 millimeters thick veneer. Very veneer thin, pulp, yes. And cut the plug and then cut a hole or cut the negative the same distance, 0 0.63 millimeters deep and have a perfect fit. Wow. So that's what we're gonna do. So first of all, we're gonna cut the positive, we'll cut the shape. And so what all I've done is just here on this piece of plywood, I've just put a piece of double stick tape and took another piece of uh, plywood and just stuck it down. And now we're just gonna cut it out right here. So I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna turn my back on. So there you could see, it's just a, there's that's my your positive, plug, right? that's my plug, that's the positive. Right. And now we'll come over to, just for the sake of an example here, what I've done is taken a, a Sharpie and just made a mark mm -hmm. right here. So pretending that that's some form of defect or that's where we want to place the positive, we're going to cut the negative out right here. So the first thing I'll do is I'm gonna come over to my spot and I'm going to cut out the inside of the line. I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut out the pocket area, the majority of the area first, mm -hmm. then I'll cut to the line and then the plug should fit right in. Wow. Let's come over here, I'm gonna change this to a pocket. And cut this out.
Okay. Let's see how we do. Sometimes these little guys right here, little burr, we need to clean that up a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what's really amazing is, is that yeah. it is not only the shape on the outside is correct, but the depth is correct too. Yeah. And it's consistent all the way across. So a little bit of glue underneath there, clamp it down, and then some sandpaper, mm -hmm. and then basically that goes away. Just watching that operation, uh, I saw how the spindle itself moves so that it can uh, replicate that path. Right. That is truly amazing. Right. I'm gonna have to get one of these in my shop. What do you, you think? Need, I think you need that. Yeah. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have left for this episode of the Highland Woodworker. Be sure to check us out on social media and until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland woodworker.